Let's think about an essential question. What is electricity and how does it behave? This is foundational for this course in that we're going to be building simple circuits and interfacing uh, microcontrollers to motors and send sensors in our projects. So we need, need some working knowledge of electrical theory in order to build and test these circuits. It's the foundation of computing, and so this kind of theory enters into the core of almost all modern devices. Um, so let's start with a couple observations. First is electricity is invisible. You don't see it with your eye. Um, we use it for a couple of different purposes. We use electricity to convey energy. An example would be the power out of your wall socket. We use it to convey information. That's like any kind of network connection or phone line or lots and lots of connections within devices. And these are the, these are the kind of purposes that we, we achieve with it. We're going to start with a fairly abstracted vision of the principles um, and then work towards uh, the kind of practical hands-on elements. So just to begin with some core definitions, let's think about current. A water current is a motion, is a, is a current, a water current is a movement of water. An electrical current is a movement of charge carriers. That can be several different things. An electron can convey a negative charge. In semiconductors and metals, the absence of an electron can convey a, a positive charge. The truth is, for what we're doing, that distinction doesn't really matter. And I think it's easier just to think about uh, positively charged things that are the electrical particles that are moving. And that motion is what forms a current. So here we have some electricity, thinking about it as individual charges moving along. For convenience, we can just think of it as moving along a wire for now. And so that motion is the current. We can measure it if we were to uh, take some kind of cross-section of the, of the wire and count the number of charge carriers moving past it. We can come up with a measurement, which is that when some very large number of charges move past it per second, that's an ampere commonly abbreviated with simply A. For our purposes, an ampere is a, is a relatively large current, it, uh, perhaps a larger motor or a, a larger hobby servo. And so we mostly deal in kind of tens to hundreds of milliamperes. So you're more likely to see the MA for milliampere symbol kind of in our, in our most daily usage. Currents are directional. Uh, if you think about the current flowing through this point as a positive current, the same current flowing in the opposite direction would be a negative current. So there is some sense of when you're taking a measurement of uh, what is the, the direction of the measurement, and that determines the sign of the current that you measure. Another question is how fast does it go? And the sort of net answer is that electricity moves along conductors at some appreciable fraction of the speed of light. For our purposes with our circuits, it's effectively instantaneous. If you're doing computer design or, or transmission line design, the speed is actually quite important and becomes part of the process. But for our needs, uh, electricity is effectively instantaneous, and we're not going to worry about the time constants or the propagation delays of electricity moving around our circuits. Another question you might ask then is what makes the current move? Like what makes the charges move along a conductor or through your circuit? And there's several different answers. Um, one could be electric fields that in that um, opposite charges attract, like, like charges repel. And so some kind of physical forces between particles might actually create, uh, create the motion of the currents. Um, magnetic fields can also in, induce uh, currents. But um, this is easiest to understand simply as abstracting all those effects down to the idea of electric potential. And so if we, if we think about that one end of a circuit has a positive potential, and this is still an abstract notion, and the other a lower potential is a negative potential, then there will be some motion induced, some basically a force induced upon the charges and they'll move through the circuit. That can be very clear in a vacuum tube, which we're not going to use. Um, literally, the, the electrons leave one part of the tube, and they boil off into the vacuum, and they're attracted across a vacuum by a, a, a positively charged uh, plate at the other end, and that's how the circuit's formed. For us, we're going to mostly be using, you know, conducting, uh, car charges along wires, and so we have uh, sort of well-defined points to think about where the voltage exists. A common analogy here might be to gravitational potential. If I think about having a cliff with something, you know, sitting at the, at the top of the cliff uh, and gravity, you know, pulling down uh, so that something could fall off the cliff, 
we say that that object has a potential energy in the gravitational potential. It's at rest, it's static, it's not moving, so there's no kinetic energy in that object. If I push it over the edge and it falls, it acquires kinetic energy as it accelerates toward the bottom, and then it might come to rest at the bottom, and we would say it has a lower gravitational potential. And this is sort of analogous to the electric potential. There's a, a difference in potential between two points. There's a static potential energy that can be converted to a kinetic energy. And we can think about that a little bit. Um, in some sense, the, the current uh, is effectively the, related to the kinetic energy because it's a kinetic property. It's the, it's the charges moving, and much like the object falling, um, that can do work as it moves. The potential uh, between the two points is a potential energy, and we're going to name it now. Um, we use volts, and we call it a voltage. And that has something to do with the, the static difference between two places. One can have a voltage between two points without any currents flowing under certain conditions, which is analogous to our objects at the top of the cliff. There's a, a difference in potential from the situation, but it hasn't been realized into any, any movement. In our circuits, generally when we form a voltage, there'll be some pathway along which the current can flow, and then the, the charges will move along the wires, and then we'll actually have a current flowing. Another sort of analogy that comes up is thinking about fluids through a pipe. If we have some reservoir at, 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 a, at a high pressure uh, and a second end of the pipe at a low pressure, um, then um, pressure, there we go, uh, then liquids will tend to flow in the pipe. And sometimes this analogy is useful. We may resort to it from time to time. It's imprecise for a couple reasons, partly because uh, most people don't have actually a good intuition for what happens when you go through constrictions and pipes and how that behaves. But there is some idea there of there being a static pressure where the liquid's under pressure, and then a valve might open, and the fluid or liquid can flow through into areas of lower pressure, which is at least reasonably analogous to a switch allowing current to flow through a circuit. Another question about uh, the voltage as a relative measurement is, it's always relative, is where is zero? And actually, I'm going to just say here, we tend to just choose a zero. Physically, the Earth itself is often a zero point for, for voltages. We call it ground as a result. In practice, our circuits will pick a point to be the ground, often like the negative terminal of the battery or the negative terminal of the supply, and call that zero, and then all voltages are, are measured relative to that. So um, to think about that a little bit more, let's talk a little bit more about the notation of circuits, because that's essential for actually conveying the ideas as we discuss them. The circuits that we make will use a kind of idealized schematic notation that's common in electronics. And the, the point point off the top is that the schematic is an abstraction. There's many, many possible physical implementations of any given schematic. It's, it's, a, it's an idealization that allows us to represent how the circuit is connected without necessarily worrying about the exact components and how they're placed in space. So circuits, in some sense, are graphs. A graph has nodes and has some idea of there being connections between them. So if I have two nodes with connections between them, there's something abstracted where I have these two things that each have terminals, and then there's some kind of uh, arc that connects between them. To make that slightly more concrete, I'm going to draw the symbol for a battery. The symbol for a battery has these plates that is actually related to the structure of a, of a battery with different materials with electrolyte in between them. And the idea is this, this battery is it's a node in a circuit. It has a, some physical structure. There's lots of different types of batteries with different structure. But the key element is it has two terminals. Whatever the internals are, there's two electrical points that connect to other elements of the circle circuit. And in the battery, one of them, is, one terminal is positive and one terminal is ne negative, and the voltage potential across the battery is created by electrochemistry, the interaction of the materials in the battery that can create a difference of potential that will cause currents to flow. If I think about having something else over here, and I'm going to use a, resi a resistor symbol because it's about to become extremely familiar, the resistor is another idea, really. It, there are components called resistors, but a resistance is some amount of material on which we're going to consider two terminals. 
So the terminals are points that we might attach to electrical circuits. And the idea that the resistor is currents can flow through it and has some properties we'll discuss uh, presently. So I have these two nodes in my, in my schematic here. And if I draw a line to connect the terminals, I've created a simple circuit, which is effectively a heater. The battery will induce a current through the resistor, which will convert that current into heat. But the idea is these lines here are idealized abstractions of wires. This is a perfect wire. When I draw it in a schematic, it means a abstracted, perfect, zero resistance, you know, perfect conductor between two points. And that's, that means that basically this whole section of the circuit is the same thing. It's some node in a graph that um, has, a, has a voltage and has no internal currents. It's just a thing that um, exists. That's actually going to become more clear as we wade through all the theory, but that's sort of a starting point for how we're going to talk about this. Let's talk about one more specific symbol that we might use right away, which is a battery is an electrochemical device. It's kind of a messy thing. It has its own properties. So electronics has invented this symbol, which is the idealized voltage source. And the idea being it's a perfect voltage source. It's abstractly perfect. So it can produce a specific voltage across it, and it will hold that voltage no matter what happens. So if it's open, there's a, a voltage potential between the two terminals, and uh, the, there's no current flowing. If I were to attach a, a, an idealized wire across it, effectively an infinite current has to flow because it's going to keep that potential no matter what. This is not a situation you can physically build. But the voltage source is effectively our perfect battery that will provide a perfect voltage that's constant at all times. This kind of gets to a larger point about these schematics, which is that this is an abstraction that has actually a strong connection to the physical reality. It turns out electronics is, is highly prone to abstraction because we can engineer the components to closely match our idealized models. So when you buy a resistor, it's engineered to have a constant resistance that's fixed by the factory to some reasonable tolerance. And over its operating range, it will act like a very linear resistor with nice properties and electronics becomes difficult when you approach the bounds of those properties. But in our domain where we're working, we're mostly going to stay at a point where those, those properties obey the idealized models pretty closely. It's kind of a lovely example where the kind of discrete nature of the circuit as components connected has allowed this engineering to produce parts that obey the rules very closely. Just to recap then, we've defined a couple terms. We've talked about currents, uh, voltages that create electric potentials between them, and then the idea of, this, of the schematic is this idealized graph. And then we've briefly introduced the idea of a resistor.